Well, welcome everybody. I know you're all entering our webinar right now. Um, as a little bit of housekeeping, um, for those of you who aren't Zoom rookies, you know that there is a chat window that you can use and we encourage you um, throughout the session today to um, participate and on the chat. So um, feel free to make comments, keep it respectful, of course. But if you have questions along the way, don't be shy. You can start to log those within um, chat. And, oh, look, Stephen Becht is already saying hi to you, Joel. It's getting, you know, you're already getting some love a few minutes in. Awesome. So welcome, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Nick Quain. I work with the Venture and Entrepreneurship Team at Invest Ottawa. And for those that don't know, Invest Ottawa, along with many other players across Ontario, has launched a program called Digital Main Street. This is a continuation of a Digital Main Street program that you might have heard of over the last few years. This one is a little bit more souped up in terms of everything that's being provided, um, funding coming from the federal government to help uh, the Main Street businesses that are in the most need given the pandemic. You think of the types of businesses on our Main Streets that relied on foot traffic. Um, obviously, there's not as much foot traffic. There's not as uh, not the um, luxury of being able to let as many people in as frequently or as density uh, as dense um, in your establishment. Um, so we have a really cool program that um, we're doing a bunch of stuff that we encourage you um, in the chat. We'll send some links along the way that you can learn a little more about the program and how you can take advantage of it. Um, but to the topic at hand, it is my pleasure to welcome Joel Parenteau from Wolf Down. Um, for those who haven't checked out Wolf Down on Bank Street, um, they are, uh, I guess were one of the new entrants to our um, uh, industry, our restaurant hospitality industry over the last year where Joel has brought German street food, um, in particular the Berlin donor, um, to the Ottawa market, much to the um, joy of uh, those who've had some German street food in the past and were pining for it. So welcome, Joel. Thank you. Great to be here. Awesome. So maybe to start, you can just give us a little bit of context on a little bit of the story um, quickly in terms of how you brought, um, you know, what you brought to Ottawa from Germany and, and a bit of the business model. Right. Um, so it's, it's kind of a funny story. It obviously, like many good stories, starts with a boy. Um, my, my fiance is German and he's, he's the one to blame for all of this. He's the one who introduced me to German street food. Um, long story short, he is, uh, been, has been in Ottawa for over a decade. He actually originally came to help start Shopify along with, with, with Toby, who's German as well. And, since since I've known them, they've always said like they love Ottawa. They're proud to have built Shopify here. But the one thing that they missed from home was the specific Berlin donor. Um, and I'd never heard of this. I was like, they and they hyped it up so much. And I was like, what are you guys talking about? Like, it can't possibly be this good. Uh, lo and behold, first time I go to Germany uh, to visit his family, and um, I I have my first bite, and I'm just like. Like, oh my God, they were so right. Like, wh what is this? How, how have they been hiding in this from us for so long? How did we not know about this? Um, so, but it was still a few years that we would just go to Germany, eat donor every day for a week, and then come back and be missing it, craving it. And every time we all got together, it would be like, someone, we, it would come up, like, someone needs to do this. Someone needs to do this. They're like, we'll invest. We don't care. Just someone needs to do this. And then Finally, one day the light bulb finally went off and I was just like, I like food. Yeah, sure. Like, why don't I just give it a shot? Um, so it kind of started as this joke, something we would chat about. And then finally just went, you know, screw it. Let's, let's just try it. Um, and here we are. <laughs> here we are. That's awesome. And you had obviously been, you had been part of a few tech startups up to that point. Had that been, did that uh, embolden you or give you more hesitation given the switch of industries or how did that play into your thoughts? I think, I mean, the experience is, though it's very different, um, I think I've taken a lot of the startup mentality with me and applied that in the, the restaurant space, which it's obviously gives me a little bit of a more uh, unconventional approach um, because I actually had zero restaurant experience. So um, some of it transitions, uh, a lot of the rest of it was just uh, a steep learning curve, but I, <laughs> I kind of like new challenges. So that really is actually what excite, excited me. And 
to this day, I think I'm surprised by how much I've taken to this industry and how much I kind of like the chaos of it. Um, <laughs> it's been really fun. Chaos indeed. Well, you've run into it now. We all have in some ways. And, and we're here to dig a little bit deeper into, um, you know, the idea around new business models for restaurants and hospitality. And obviously there's the delivery model of, uh, you know, if, uh, if you can't, if Muhammad can't go to the mountain, bring the mountain to Muhammad or however you want to look at it. Um, give us a little context on, um, you know, for those who haven't visited Wolf Down, um, your mix of sort of takeout versus sit down, sort of average bill size. And then you were using Uber Eats before, you know, if we're sort of going back to February of the, yeah. before the pandemic hits, just sort of set the scene before the pandemic of the state of the business. Right. So pre-pandemic, I mean, donor is street food. It is poised to kind of be take, take and go. Um, we were already doing a, a bunch of delivery before the pandemic that said, we were slightly skewed to maybe a little bit more diet, not dine in, like we just have a few tables, but sit down coming yeah. in to order, um, even if they were taking it out. Um, now, basically, once the pandemic hit, that balance just shifted. So we we're fortunate enough that we were already primed and, and able to do takeout. We we're used to that. It's just that the ratios went from, you know, maybe 60, 40 to now 80% delivery. Um, and the vast majority of that on, on Uber Eats. So those numbers just kind of skyrocketed, whereas um, the in-store in POS numbers took a dive, but they actually kind of balanced each other out in the end. It's just a shift in the style of business that we're, we're doing. In our case, um, the ticket price, like a sandwich is about $12. We have a lot of customers who are just going in to grab a sandwich for themselves um, sometimes too. Uh, we do do the odd kind of family meal, but um, it's, a, it's a low price point. So it's a, it's a lot of volume at low cost versus um, you know, what we would see with, with fine dining or something where people are sitting down with the whole family for a whole meal. Right, um, right. So that obviously skews the equation a little bit. Yeah, and lends itself to the percentage model of Uber Eats a little bit more favorably for the lower price point. Now, at that point, had you used um, Skip the Dishes, DoorDash? Had you you experimented with other other the sort of the bigger uh, delivery services? Yeah. So actually, our our mentality from day one was actually try them all and and kind of weed them out. So. From the start, we had we turned them all on. So Skip, Uber, um, DoorDash, Fedora, that's now bankrupt, Ritual. Um, and basically, because I like to just experiment and see which one we did the best with. And um, by by like a mile, Uber Eats is just has the most volume. Um, so that's been our, our main focus. We do some Skip as well. Fedora, as I said, went bankrupt. Ritual was not really... The right fit for us and DoorDash just doesn't have as much of the volume. So we originally turned them on simply because we were told that they were the only ones that would go cross the river and go to Quebec. So we had customers in Hall Gatineau that were requesting it. So we did that, but I think they now changed their radius and I don't think they do that anymore. So then we're like, well, you're not useful to us anymore then. Um, right. So it wasn't the it, it was more just the pure volume that Uber brought to the table either. And did you have a feel for, you know, did you ever, like, how did you get a feel for how many people who knew of Wolf Down and were looking for it found you through Uber Eats or how many people, you know, were you able to get, you able to glean that even, you know, uh, anecdotally to get a feel for, or how many people discover you for the first time on Uber Eats? Right. So we don't have that. They don't give you that exact. I mean, right. there's no way to know that exact data because it's a new customer on Uber Eats. That said, it wasn't long after we opened that even our regulars that like found us and loved us, even friends of mine um, were asking for us to be on Uber Eats because, hey, we're all busy. They don't all have time to come to Bank Street. The parking's a nightmare. I get it. Um, and we all like to work from our desks. So they, they were demanding it to be on Uber Eats pretty much from the get go. And I get it. I mean, I'm on the flip side, I'm a huge consumer of Uber Eats. I use it all the time to order food to myself as well. It's just a function of, of lifestyle. Um, 
And so I totally understood it. So for a lot of customers, it's cannibalizing in one hand, but it's also incrementally increasing their frequency on the other hand, um, because they're just able to get it much more conveniently, much more often. Yeah, no, makes sense. And then, so at that point, and you know, in one of your medium posts, you talked about how you, you increase the price to account or at least offset part of that. Had you done that already by February, 2020, or was that something as the volume increased, you said, okay, we've, we've got to adjust this a little bit and have the customer pay a little bit more for the convenience of us sending it through Uber Eats. Yeah, actually we did that from day one. Um, that was probably something that helped with my kind of naive take coming into this industry but everybody just told me the margins are super tight and we we did a lot of cost analysis before opening but you don't really know till you get started what your overhead is going to be what your labor cost is going to be so i just all i knew was that it was going to be super tight so when you see uber takes 30 percent, i'm like well that's never like you don't need to be a mathematician to figure out that like that's not gonna fly i literally have no choice but to increase my price or else this is going to be we're going to be bleeding money. Um, so we did it from day one and um, we increased it by about 20%, not the full 30. And I just said like, this is the only way this makes sense. So if you want it on Uber Eats, you're asking for it, this is going to be what it costs. So let's see, let's see if they still want it. And overwhelmingly no one, like no one ever complained. I don't know if they mm-hmm. notice or they're just like, yeah, whatever, I still want it. Um, but I mean, if anything, the, the demand's been overwhelming. So, uh, and I think what, I think people are willing to pay for the convenience. And the only thing I think is regretful of how Uber Eats has done it is that they've shifted a large portion of that cap, the, the cost onto the restaurant instead of shifting more onto the customer. Um, Cause they don't want the customer to see all these extra fees. Yeah. Um, so we've just had to take it into our own hands and go like, no, sorry. But like, so I've increased the price. So the customer is still paying more. It's just looking like it's coming from me. But at the end of the day, you, the customers clearly are valuing the convenience regardless of the fact that it might cost, you know, in our case, $2 more to get your donor um, because they're paying it and the value is still there for them. Right. Yeah. And and I know that that was part of having been in the transportation industry for a period. Um, that was part of the challenge with Uber when they rolled out just their, their, their driving service too, was that people would, the drivers obviously um, got uh, a much lower amount than the total that you, that you received. Um, I got a question here from Adam, that, Adam that just came in. I think people order on apps. People don't look at the price coming on the credit card. People want convenience. So yeah. So is the price sensitivity on an app, um, lower, um, you know, when I'm, you know, at my desk and it takes me three thumb presses to get my Berlin donor sent to me. Um, you know, that's a fair point. And I think, I think there's a whole convenience mentality that, you know, the one click, the two clicks, like all of a sudden that, you know, I'm willing to pay, um, a little bit more for that now for Uber, like what for Uber Eats, what, what was the, um, you know, any challenges though that you've had to like in terms of maybe talk about delivery area. I know that that can shift and change at times. Has that been an issue for you? And, and if so, in what ways? Yeah. I mean, we always wish they would expand their delivery reach. Cause we always have those people who are just like, just on the border of where they go. And I mean, even, um, currently, because we're in center town, we kind of just go to downtown core, sometimes the, the edges of east or west, but we don't go, you know, full on to Nepean or to Orleans. And we know we have customers down there that would love for us for it to work, but um, that's completely out of our control. We've asked Uber about it. It's a custom secret algorithm they have that takes all sorts of, you know, population density, distance, drivers, types of food. It takes a bunch of things into account high tech and they, that's all they will tell you. Um, so that's, uh, unfortunate, um, that we can't get to everybody. Um, in terms of other challenges, you're still at the mercy of, of these drivers. And so on one hand, you have the ultimate convenience of when we have, you know, 
12 orders coming in at once. We have 12 drivers there, you know, in five minutes flat. So that's, that's amazing, but you're still going to have the odd driver that screws up in some way, bring grabs the wrong bag and takes it to the wrong customer. Or um, we had a crazy situation last week where um, a driver came, she had two deliveries. She tries to grab the second bag, drops her phone, her phone is destroyed. And now she has no clue where she's supposed to bring this food. And she calls Uber and they don't have a way of just- Canceling the order and rebooking yeah, it or something. Like how do you- Driver. Um, so they just cancel the orders and we have to do it. And just like, that's like in the middle of rush. And we're like, right. we don't have time to deal with this. Um, and the customer just sees the order canceled. They don't necessarily know what happened. Um, and. So, you know, shit happens like anything else, but it's also things that theoretically could happen if we had our own delivery driver team, like there's, there's always human error. Mm, interesting. Robert and Donna just uh, posted that they, um, when they were investiga investigating both Uber and Skip, that, that those guys were at, that both were adamant that the price matched the delivery price, um, not allowed to have a different price. And I know that there's been some back and forth on that and some of the conversations in social on your side, and I've seen it elsewhere where so there's a is, positioning, but doesn't seem to be a firm rule. This was a hundred percent their stance when they started, but they've since reneged and gone back on that. And I've, I've spoken with Uber and they, they'll admit, like, if you look at the contract, it doesn't uh, state that anymore. Um, even then they never policed it well from the start, but um, they officially let you do whatever you want now. And almost everybody has increased their prices. So yes, they, they would have told you that back in the day, back in the day, but yeah. it is different yeah. now and just do it. <laughs> Yeah, and that's uh, that uh, that myth has survived, um, or maybe not a myth, but the, the, that perception. Now, now, what about um, we talked a little bit when uh, you and I spoke about owning the customers and some of the concern over or lack of concern o over if the sheer numbers are coming in, um, the fact that you don't know who these customers are, you don't know where they're coming from, and and sort of losing touch with your customers to a degree. Yeah. So. A lot of the argument for owning your customers comes from, you know, if you want to remarket to them or you to have some data on them. And at the end of the day, my stance on this is that the, the value that Uber brings. So if we have a customer that orders on Uber, some, some of them might be people that sometimes come in store and sometimes order on Uber. But I think the vast majority of the Uber customers are like, they order just on Uber from us and I mean, I have restaurants where that's the deal that they're not convenient for me to get to. So I've never actually been there, but I order from them all the time. And to me, I'm, I'm totally cool with that. And if Uber's created the convenience for me to be able to have them as a repeat customer. Um, so they've just actually launched this cool new feature on Uber that on our tablet, on our side, we see how many times you've ordered from us. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like this game now we watch it and we're like, oh, this person like 24 times. And then we were like, oh, this person like, or 50 times. And last week we saw one 101 times. And we're like, whoa, that's crazy. Um, but that's cool. And we know, so like that we are already, how do I put this? We rely on our food being craveable and, and being good enough that that's what gets us the repeat customers not having to remarket or spam or you know, throw all these promos. We don't do promos. We don't discount. So um, the keeping that customer to us is more a question of us providing quality food. Um, and that's what we're focused on, not owning their email address. For now, what about, that makes sense. So now what about, um, what's the influx of orders or inquiries that you've had to field from people outside of that Uber delivery area, right? So, and maybe some of them, you know, hey, you delivered to me yesterday, now you're not, or they are not. Um, aside from those, um, those changes, how have you handled, obviously, hey, come, come pick it up and we'll, you know, it's here for you. But how have you looked at that? Have you quantified that at all? Have you been, you know, I know even in terms of looking at ghost kitchens or what other markets to start to serve, have you been quantifying that at all to try and get a feel for what markets are, are demanding the Berlin donor the most? Yeah. So we certainly have a 
a decent amount of customers who always they come in and like I drove all the way from Barhaven, I drove all the way from Orleans. Like, why don't you like open one in 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 these areas? And it's certainly something that we keep in mind and that we would consider. Um, the alternative that we're also considering versus uh, you know setting up a full other location in these um, more suburban markets is the idea of these ghost kitchens that you know you may have heard about where it's really a delivery only kitchen so you you can do things very lean because you basically just need a space where you can churn out the food and from that central location you again you have a new radius so you'd have you know whatever it's somewhere around 10 kilometers of not imperfect but like so if we were to place one in the east and one in the west that could serve those geographical areas on Uber, um, that's one one strategy that we're considering. Um, uh, and but at the end of the day, we have to just currently say like, well, thanks for for driving in and coming to see us when when you can. And even though they we realize that they say like the, we'd be here every week if it was if it was closer. Right. So that, See a question here. Oh, Mr. Kevin French, former CEO of Mobile Knowledge, who understands the transportation world and the Uber, a veteran of the Uber wars like me, um, asking about um, responsibility for food quality upon arrival. So, yeah. you know, I guess there's a question of how well your food travels, how long it lasts, and, and a question that you need to think about. And then what happens? I mean, traffic delays haven't been an issue since March too much, <laughs> but um, that certainly uh, was an issue beforehand, I'm sure. Yeah, so um, you, you touched on it exactly with the how well food travels. As a restaurateur, it's your, I think it's your responsibility to only put things on delivery that you know keep well. Um, so there's certain foods that should be eaten right away, you know, served in front of you on a plate, and there's certain foods that can travel. Um, so all our food is, is kind of designed for that. It's street food. So fortunately for us, it keeps really well, and that's why we're confident doing delivery, and it can keep well for hours. So, I mean, it's best fresh, but it's, it's still going to be good, and that's why it's a good food for delivery. Um, certain things may not be as as prone, you know, whether it's um, something where your sauce will separate, like pasta where the sauce will separate, it's not as good, or like you might not want to, and, and some people have, or some restaurants have found great solutions to that. Maybe it's um, kind of deconstructing it um, and then you assemble it yourself so it still tastes better. So that side is definitely um, the restaurant's responsibility to make sure that you're not sending food that is you know in an hour is just not going to be great um at the, and for the traffic delays that's that's just a reality of life so everybody should just understand that that said i will say that to me one of the greatest um advantages i guess of uber eats is because they have the volume they have the drivers to our restaurant in like three minutes mm -hmm. so as soon as we make it, they're getting it and they're getting to you. With Skip and some of the others, sometimes we've been waiting for a Skip driver for an hour. It's so like we made it and the driver didn't show up. So that sucks because it was just sitting on the pass for a long time. And it said the driver was coming, but he wasn't. Um, so, and that's where this whole idea of volume and a dominant player actually is makes sense because the it's, it's an on-demand thing so the more drivers you have on the road the more precise it gets and the quicker it gets and uber eats in ottawa by a mile has is the the best at that yeah certainly that combined with the managing expectations of being able to track your meal so um you know i don't know how many People remember the day when you ordered pizza and you're waiting for the doorbell to ring and you just like would wait for a half hour and it would never come. Um, that would have saved a lot of anxiety to know exactly where that pizza driver was. Now, what about, um, did you look at any of the local solutions? I know that Love Local um, and, and uh, Trek City is one that's looking at it that does delivery. Did you look at those and how did they factor in, at, if at all? Yeah. So we, we certainly check them out. I try to keep it on everything going on. At the end of the day, um, I feel like those services were a better fit or are a better fit for uh, restaurants that are doing bigger meals. Um, 
it's because in our case, we do a lot of one-off sandwiches uh, that orders can come in 12 orders at once for $12, right? Um, so for us, it's a lot more about speed, convenience, and efficiency um, than having, and like the, the, those people want the order on demand. Like they're just, they're hungry right now. They don't necessarily pre-plan their meals. So that's where I think these local services um, their bread and butter or where they really excel is, hey, I'm planning family meal for Tuesday night um, from Becta. So I'm going to have this whole like fantastic meal. The price point's going to be higher there and I'm going to pick a time. So that's where that totally makes sense. Us, it's like, oh, I actually, I need five drivers like two minutes from now. You good? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you can do the math. I mean, I think that Love Local is a $5 fixed price between four and eight o'clock. And I don't think they do. I think one of the questions actually um, that upon registration, and I don't have the answer if anyone does, um, uh, regarding someone in Stittsville or Canada, it was Donna from the Grounds Cafe asking about what delivery in Canada or Stittsville. I believe Love Local goes as far as Britannia you know, sort of Bayshore area, um, but $5 fixed rate and obviously do the math on a percentage, 30%, you know, at, uh, at uh, whatever you get to it, at, 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 you know, you're, you're at 30 or $40, you start to think about which way you want to go on average bill size um, in, in terms of the pricing point, um, or even maybe $25, $30 for that matter. Um, now, you talked a little bit about, you know, the types, obviously price point impacts UberX in terms of the average transaction value. Um, and then, you know, we talked about how well food travels and then there's also the, you know, the, um, the labor costs and you had a, you had a good medium post that broke down, you know, sort of food costs versus labor costs versus sort of covering your overhead and getting above that threshold and the efficiency of sort of how quickly can I assemble certain meals. So that's one part of it. And then the other part is how, how big is your menu and do you adjust the menu for Uber Eats in light of the facts that some things are more labor intensive and maybe don't lend themselves, they don't travel as well. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about that in, in terms of how that was a fit for, for Wolf Down. Right, so I mean, we're fortunate, uh, though this is by design that we have already probably the smallest menu out there. Um, we only do three things. So all of that was designed from day one for being streamlined efficiency. And this is where you kind of see my more startup mentality coming into play. Um, so we are designed for, for that. We already have such a small menu and I would certainly encourage any other restaurants as well to figure out which items they can throw together very quickly and which items have the best margins and which ones actually travel well. Um, in terms of, this has been actually really interesting, in terms of our output from a labor efficiency perspective, uh, what I wasn't, what I didn't expect would be so drastic in the change with COVID is that we went from um, slightly more in, in person interaction. So the person, the customer would come and speak with us and and that's great. We have so many regulars that we love. They chat with us or a, a new customer that we are explaining to them the difference between a donor and a shawarma or explaining what the sauces are. So those interactions can take us a few minutes. Um, now we've shifted to predominantly just reading an order off the screen when it comes from Uber or even from um, our own website where you online ordered. We're just reading off the screen and making that sandwich. We this whole side of the equation is just gone and we've saved all that time. So it really became clear when one week at the end of the week, we looked at our numbers and we're just like, we just did like, we just broke our record numbers and yet we did it with less staff than we've ever had. And we realized it's just because of the efficiency of sad as it sounds but of not having to yeah the assembly line was just completely yeah. streamlined with the orders just going right there we we're just making food um yeah. and not worrying about anything else our only interaction was with uber drivers basically right now um, were you that, now that makes sense and you see all sorts of businesses trying to automate everything to self-serve online so that they can cut down on you know so many businesses make it hard to talk to a person um but did you within Uber Eats or within your website, did you add more information or did you already have it there to address those questions? Because 
that would be the concern would be now I'm not going to place the order because I don't know the difference between one saucer, you know, whether I'll like it or the allergies or what have you. Um, did, was there, was that already populated or did you have to address that sort of specifically? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So we, from the start, we tried to have good descriptions and actually it's funny because if you watch the comments that people leave, you start to figure out what they're wondering about. Um, and so a lot of our menu we re-engineered based on what people were asking um, to make it easier for them to, to select in or out of certain things. So we noticed, for instance, a lot of people were commenting like, can I get extra sauce on the side? So we added extra sauce on the side as an option. Um, uh, that said, we also always, from the start, design the menu so that you're able to customize it. Now, this this is something that actually really I think is really important and really bothers me when I'm on the flip side ordering from a restaurant that doesn't enable this is um, unless you're, and that's cool. If you're going to be stringent, they're like, Hey, no substitutions. If you have to get it the way it is, if that's your stance, cool. Um, but for me, I'm, I'm a pretty picky eater. I'll be the first one to admit. So sometimes I, you know, I don't want the cheese or I don't want the pickles, for instance, if you don't have that as um, an option, on your menu and you don't allow notes, then I'm not gonna order the food because I can't get it the way I want it or, or need it. Um, and I think that's a, that's a big shame. And, or I can, some people leave it in the notes, but when I'm commenting in the notes, I'm never quite sure that they're gonna see it because it actually, just so you know, as a consumer, the notes like sometimes um, you don't see them. So here's the, the biggest issue with Uber Eats. Their tablet is like this mini tablet like this. So sometimes I can, we can't even see the notes until we scroll to the bottom. And when it's really busy, we're just making the order. And then we s scroll up and we're like, oh, they wrote they didn't want the sauce on it. Um, and then we have to start over. That explains it for me. I'm always asking for extra cheese, not take the cheese off. And there you yeah. Go. So <laughs> if they made their menu, extra cheese, $1, you click on it. There's no way we're going to miss that. Yeah. Right. And, and it's easy for you because you can just select that as a thing. So build your menus to make it easy for the customer to get what they want without having to try to explain to you in the comments and hoping that you understand what they mean or just for them to not have. Some people just won't write comments so they won't get the food that they want because they're too shy to ask for it. But, you know, that's just allow for customization if if that's, you know, cool with your restaurant and your, your right. concept. Now, what about for pickup? Have you thought about trying to, given the efficiency for delivery, mm -hmm. um, have you thought about allowing people outside of the Uber Eats zone to pay, come in and have it just walk in with their number and pick it up versus we're trying to get rid of this people interaction, um, not trying to get rid of it, yeah. but we're creating an efficient machine. If someone wants to come talk to you, you'll talk to them, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, have you thought about that at all or is that uh, not worth the effort at this point in terms of the volume? So we, we do have online ordering as well for pickup. So oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, you can go wolfdan.com. That's actually, the we have always had that. People didn't mm. really use it much pre-COVID. So that's the cool thing is like now people call. Um, so actually, this is a good point to bring up. People call and they always want to do phone, phone orders. And they don't understand why we don't like to do that. It's like, well, one, usually we're like... It always happens when we're slammed already. So it's like, I don't have time to sit here and take your order and it's loud and we can't hear i might understand it wrong and i don't know when you're coming um and there's 12 orders ahead of you so how do i decide so usually we tell people and they sometimes they get pretty mad at us and i'm like i don't have the time to take your order right now and i don't know where you'd be in the queue and god forbid something happens and you don't show up now we've made it and you haven't paid for it um if you want to pay for it over the phone that's going to take even more time and it's going to hurt our credit score i don't know most people don't realize that but if you take a credit card number sight unseen that's bad for us um, because it's a higher risk transaction and we will our payment processing rates are going to go up so there's a number of reasons we shouldn't be doing that um so that's just my little <laughs> rant on mm. phone, phone calls um and why it's just not a good system but wolfdown.com you go order and that was the only way we were doing pickup at when we first started phasing back in um because it was exactly completely contactless and you were in the store for all of 10 seconds the bag would be there with your name on it pick up and go um that is still probably the optimal 
way to get wolf down today if you're able to do it but now that they've relaxed the the regulations we now allow people to come in and order that said we we ask that they only have a tap card so again you're not touching our screen you're not touching our stuff you're not yeah. touching even a, a a pin pad or anything it's you're just grabbing your card touching the little thing that goes beep um so it's still 100 percent contactless very cool now what about your website so what do you do you look at it weekly in terms of the um you know the analytics of visitors right so you're obviously you you get to see your orders you're getting and you know as you start to think okay where if i were going to do a ghost kitchen like you know where are my orders coming from obviously there those orders are being placed so not necessarily lost orders um but what about the other traffic the bounces the you know where it's coming from do you look at that much have you done any online marketing what have you done over over this year you know both pre and post covid to try and get a feel for and sort of tap into the market a little more um mostly we don't do any paid advertising um that's just something that you know if you can rely on word of mouth you might as well um especially with restaurants i think it's hard to get the conversion from um, paid ads what we've really focused on is is social media and so we we do work um with a lot of the foodie influencers, as you call them, the city. Fortunately, they found us pretty quickly um, and all reached out and, and wanted to work with us. So that's a, a fun, easy collab. It gets the pictures of the food out there. I mean, there's no better medium than Instagram for food. Um, so that, that's been fantastic. And then basically relying on, we were really cognizant of trying to access or to be there for the kind of niche communities um so fortunately we have our tofu donor which has been like a huge hit with the vegan community and they're it's it's a great group they're super vocal um so if they like you they talk about you and that's that's been a huge plus uh we also recently just actually during covid announced that we now had a halal meat supplier so again we were, you know, very warmly received by the halal community, and and that's also really helped get the word out. Um, but we really just have the best customers that do all the marketing for us. Um, and that's the best way. Happy customers. Uh, that'll create that that viral side. Um, Robert and Don asked. Um, I probably know the answer to this, if I had to guess. But the online ordering uh, platform you're using, you're using Square, Shopify. Um, I'm going to get in trouble for this. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I guess. Um, not Shopify. Um, as much as I want to, and as much as we've talked and argued about it, the reality is Shopify is the best at retail, and restaurants are a different beast. Um, you can hack it to make it work, um, but that's not, um, not their focus. And uh, I actually just had another chat with Toby about it a couple weeks ago and and he agrees in now um, after a lot of <laughs> pressure and stuff but um, they're just they're best at retail uh, we use Square for online or sorry in-store POS yeah. and um, they've recently added online ordering as a feature but they didn't have it when we started so we actually use a company called Chow Now um, which is just a um, you know, SaaS kind of service that you plug into online that allows you to build all, all of your online ordering. So basically from our website, you just add the link through to Chow Now and then you order um, you order there and it shows up on a tablet in our- Okay, and maybe that's partially answering Stephen's question who just asked about what, what's the challenge of using Shopify? It doesn't allow for that easy integration? Um, no, the integration would be easy. Um, it's the, the degree of variance that we need to deal with. Um, you know, this isn't just one shirt, blue or red. Um, the degree of... All the permutations there, and combinations of the different yeah, uh, dynamics of an order. It doesn't deal well with the degree of variables. Um, mm. It also doesn't allow for you to input a time for picking up your order. So... I literally had this, this issue with the restaurant last week where I wanted to order, but I couldn't put what time I wanted to pick it up. So I didn't order because I was like, I don't know if they're going to have my food ready when I'm hungry. <laughs> like, when right. Was, or if it's going to have been sitting there for four or five hours. <laughs> exactly. And I don't want to just like place an order and wait for them to maybe say if 
I can come pick up my food now or in an hour or tomorrow. Right. Um, now, S Steven's jumping on asking if you've used the infinite options Shopify app or, and the delivery date and time Shopify app. And, and my follow up to that is, did you talk to, did, to, did that come up in your conversation when you chatted with Toby about, about what needed to be done within Shopify? Yeah, so, and that's where I said, you can hack a solution together, um, but it's not as smooth or built nicely out the box as um, some of the other solutions that are specifically designed um, for restaurants. And that's at the end of the day, what, what uh, made our, our decision. I mean, I have tech guys too, we could have made it work, um, but it's from a UI and UX perspective, it's just, it's not as smooth. Not the same thing. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about going forward. So, um, you know, obviously your, your orders are going well, you've been able to, you know, sort of keep the business going. It's not as much of a going concern as maybe some others that are out there. What are your thoughts on sort of advancing the business going forward? Are you just going to try and sort of ride it out a little bit or are you, you know, the ideas of the ghost kitchens or have you ever thought, I mean, cause you know, with a, with a street food like that, that the idea of a, a food truck or something like that, of being able to take them to different spots or, or any, any of these types of things is something that you might look at later this year in 2021. Yeah. So we're, we're doing a couple of things. Um, one, so there's, there's two kind of permutations of the ghost kitchen or the virtual kitchen. They have too many names right now, cloud kitchen and, Everybody's kind of confusing them. So there's one example whereby, um, which is something we're testing currently, where we use the kitchen at Wolfdown for a second concept that would be delivery only. Um, so we have actually launched that. People may have noticed or caught on that that's actually us doing it, but it's uh, we're also selling or created a new brand called Nutcase, which is doing um, nut milks. Oh, um, okay. And so this is something we can easily do out of our own kitchen because the equipment need is low and it allows us to use, like if we ever have excess labor time, we're able to just, hey, just make a bunch of these. Um, so that was kind of a, something we decided to experiment with during quarantine because that's what happens when I get bored. <laughs> Left alone in a kitchen for long enough. <laughs> yeah, it's been up a new company. So, and that's, that's gone pretty well. Um, so that's one version of, of a ghost kitchen. Um, the other idea, as I kind of briefly alluded to, is would be the idea of finding a space in the east and the west to have delivery-only kitchens um, for Wolfdown. So that's we do have an agent looking for spaces for us right now, but we're not sure. We haven't found the right spot. It's it's a lot about finding the right spot. Um, we also actually just signed the lease on our second location. Oh, which we haven't disclosed. is that, is, that uh, is this going to be the big reveal or are you going to wait to tell the world where the next location is going to be? Oh, I, people can probably guess it. If they know me, they can probably guess. I'll give you a hint though. It's not in Canada. Ah, and okay. actually I'm not allowed to go right now. So it's going to be an interesting remote, might be a remote restaurant opening, um, because of the borders. So yeah. Oh, so it's, is it in the U.S.? Yeah. Is it where people play poker? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. There you go. You, did, you solved it, Nick. There you well, go. no, there, people play poker in every city in the United States. So, <laughs> you know, this is not something that is clearly indicating, although there'd be some, there, there'd be some, some bets, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's funny. Okay. A any, uh, any other questions from the audience while we've got you? I'm just going to do a quick perusal of some of the questions that were submitted in advance because I haven't got to them being uh, a bit negligent down that on that side. Um, one of the questions came from um, Linda and you've sort of touched on a little bit, um, but the guidance on the efficient logistical execution between receiving the orders on tablet, punching into the POS system and communication of the orders to the kitchen. Um, now your system's all sort of integrated in that way already with Uber Eats or how have you avoided um, double entry? Integrated may not be the word. So there are actually services out there that supposedly will integrate all of these different sources into one tablet. Um, we looked at one of them, we tried to implement it and it crashed our whole system. So um, that sucked. But basically we're completely paperless so we don't print tickets for the orders, we basically just on our on our line, we have 
the Uber Eats tablet here, the Skip tablet here, and then um, we have a tablet that has this thing called Fresh KDS, which basically any in-store orders just shows up on this tablet. So we're never relying on paper or things, um, orders be, be, having to be punched in. They're all just showing up in front of us. Um, and then we just get reports independently from each of those. So it, you, unfortunately you don't have aggregate data, but because each of them just gives you different variables or different data. Um, so at the end of the day, I have to, if I want to know how many sales we did, I have to go, okay, we did, you know, combine yeah, on Uber, combine. 1K here, yeah. 2K here. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. not the greatest, but there's no good solution to that at this point, but that's more at the yeah. end of the day though, than the efficiency during the sort of stress of when, when you're juiced. Yeah. And actually it's funny because at one point we said, okay, maybe it would really be helpful to have these on one tablet, but at the same time because we have orders coming in like okay here's skip here's um actually in our online ordering so here's our chow now tablet um it actually allows us because they're on different screens and we don't have to scroll so i'm like you know ty do this one like rakim do this one like so we kind right. of just orchestrate <laughs> which order comes in um, the delivery ones usually tell you how far the driver's going is the chow now tells me what time you ordered it from so we're always kind of like it's always a mad experiment of being like, who's going to be here next? <laughs> Make that one. And yeah, it's kind of, that's part of the chaos. That's kind of fun. Awesome. We actually do have a bunch of questions that came in through the Q and A. So I'm uh, looking at those now. So one of them, um, I think we've talked a little bit in the, in the pricing of what you pay, but um, with the low cost of labor and with wage subsidies currently being offered, have you ever considered doing the deliveries yourselves? No. Um, the reality is we can't, there's no way we could do it as efficiently with the volume um, mm -hmm. we're doing. Um, just to give you an idea, let's see how many deliveries is that? Like we do hundreds of deliveries every week. Um, well, I mean, looking at your average, what would your average price point of charge with Uber Eats be? Because right there, that kind of answers the question, right? Of what right. You so, today. so over 50% of our orders is one sandwich. So $14. Um, and we do hundreds of those. Uh, yeah. so and you're increasing your online orders by two or your Uber Eats by $2. So you're really only paying a couple of bucks yeah. for delivery because somewhere in that ballpark. Because of the volume we're doing, we would need to hire a massive workforce of just drivers. Like the dri we have drivers coming in and out of our store all the time um, and just doesn't make sense. We're not able to handle yeah. that. Yeah. Now, um, to that question, I know I've talked to a couple other restaurant owners from Victoria, from the Standard, who have used their staff, in particular at times when their store, you know, when their restaurants were completely closed, they were using staff for delivery. And I think that, and, and a lot of those orders, though, were coming in in advance, so they could sort of build in the efficiency of those orders yeah. um, versus the real-time spontaneous. I think that's the, that's, you know, the price point and the spontaneity of the orders makes it really hard to use your own staff to anticipate volume versus, you know, even for someone like Steven, you know, talking about Ghost Kitchen, what Joelle's doing with the, um, with, with um, you know, her new nutcase, you, you yeah. said, um, the, um, you know, Stephen was doing the food and wine kits and, and, you know, I know he and other members of his team were, were delivering those and those were delivered at a time where, you know, he wasn't open yet, but it's off hours. So it's yeah. essentially utilizing dormant time with staff that, um, you know, obviously at this time um, that can be done. So depending on your price point, and certainly if you know you have 40 deliveries this Friday night between six and eight o'clock, and you can map that out um, using your own staff would be you know, eminently doable, one would think. Um, yes. Second question from Peter, uh, you mentioned that Uber is fast to pick up. Is there any data showing the delivery time to the customer? Do you get that back so that you know how many, how long it took for, for each delivery or on average? No, we don't. Um, that's on the, on the consumer side. And that's what we let the consumer decide. So, I mean, as a consumer, I, I've, I order enough from them that I know that they're generally pretty efficient. Um, and the consumer can see that they can see when exactly it was picked up and how long it took to get to them. And if the delay was because um, the dro driver sat at the restaurant for 10 minutes because the restaurant had, didn't yeah. have the food ready, or did he take a joyride and a detour um, on the way to you? That said, I mean, consumers should be aware, I don't know if they are, that Uber is now not only allowing 
batching of orders. So a driver will pick up two bags from me and they might bring one to another guy before they go to you. Um, not only do they, they've been doing that for a while, but now they actually allow batching with different restaurants. restaurants so they can pick yeah. up an order from me and then they could go to Paradise Poke and then they could go to drive that one to Mike and then to you. Um, and we don't know that that's just, that's just part of how the system works. And they're generally fast enough that I don't think with Uber, it's a concern. My concern is when Skip takes an hour to get a driver to us because right. they don't have the volume. Now, what is the feedback, feedback loop though, from the consumers who get that end product from Uber Eats, right? So are you getting reports? What, what do you get back either complaining about the food, complaining about the delivery time, the rude driver, do you get a curated list or what do you get there? Yeah, so they've, so Uber Eats has actually enhanced all of this just recently. Um, for those who don't know, since Uber has like crashed in terms of the, their ride hailing service, um, all the money has gone to Uber Eats. So they're just like throwing features out nonstop. You may have noticed that they're just launching things every day right now. Um, one of those things is greater transparency in terms of um, the comments that you leave for us. So we get a summary every day. It says, hey, you got 17 reviews today, for instance, and the star rating and then the additional comments. So we have, we do see that. We see if, you know, you loved it, you hated it, whatever. Um, and we're prompted to look at that now too, which before it was just kind of like, you'd have to go look for it. Um, but on the consumer side, you also kind of get some transparency into how we're, how the other consumers think we're doing because you see our star rating and you see if we're top eats. So one of the things that we're pretty proud of is that we're const always listed as one of Uber's top eats. Um, we have 4.9 out of five stars and uh, with over 500 reviews. And we're on one of only, I think, three restaurants in Ottawa that have that volume and that rating. Um, so if as a consumer, you, you want to, it works like any other Google review or Yelp or whatever, like you can still, you can see what, what our customers are rating us and you can kind of choose your, based on that, if you're, if that's something you want to do. Now, obviously you can't, you can't communicate back with any of the customers in any way, because you're sort of, there's a curtain between the two of you. So if there's a confusing comment or something that you're concerned about in terms of quality of food, whatever it might've been. Yeah. Do you have that option to reach out and, so, and get a further inquiry sent back? Just as of two weeks ago, we can send one reply, but you cannot reply back to us. So if you're really unhappy, I can write like, I'm so sorry, we'll fix it. Or I can write something and I can send you um, a credit. But it's only a one way interact. Like it's only a once mm -hmm. like to answer if you had a question or to answer that I'm sorry you had a bad experience or like, hey, glad you're happy whatever it might be interesting interesting okay. obviously they're testing it out little baby steps to make sure yeah. they don't uh, totally um, allow everyone to uh, communicate through um, okay one, one last question I know we're running out of time here um, any advice for restaurants in the suburbs where um, common delivery services don't necessarily cover as a consumer I ordered from DoorDash from restaurants listed on their website only to get we don't deliver message after they let us go through all the ordering process Been through that um, on different um, services too. Uh, any advice? Yeah, so this I, I've heard I actually I live in Centertown too. So I'm not too familiar with this, but I've heard this from others as well that like oh in Canada or to Peter Stittsville the selection is is pretty sad. So all I could say was I would, I would urge restaurants in those areas to, you know, get on there. Your, your customers want their food on Uber Eats. So, you know, take advantage of that, get on those services and start serving them. Um, and if you don't, then hopefully we'll open a ghost kitchen and get out there. Soon. <laughs> Awesome. Well, it's 3.55. I'm going to give like five seconds of thanking Joelle. If any other questions come in, um, we might answer them. Otherwise, uh, thank you for your time, Joelle. That was thank awesome. You. You've done a bunch of podcasts. You've done a bunch and sort of giving back to the community and giving your time here today to sort of open up and talk about your business and everything that you've learned is really helpful to the hospitality ecosystem and restaurateurs at large. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Awesome.
Yes, and then all we've got, yes, some of our Invest Ottawa folks were at Wolftown this weekend, so they're singing the praise of uh, if you have a chance, be sure to make your way down, or um, you can use Uber Eats, or you can order it if you're not within Uber Eats territory and then go pick it up yourself. So thanks all. Keep an eye out for um, more panels, workshops, webinars like this, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, Joelle. Bye. Bye.